For today's lecture, I'm really happy to welcome Dr. Jacob Lillemose from Copenhagen. Jacob is a curator, lecturer and writer, a cultural scientist and a disaster researcher. Before joining the Institute for Built Environments in 2018, he was the director of the exhibition space X and Beyond in Copenhagen, Denmark. He just published a book titled Architecture Zero. And what is more, he also worked as a consultant for the concept of our actual exhibition. For today, he is following the question the exhibition subtitle poses. What comes after the end? Taking a close look on John Hillcoat's dystopian film, The Road. So a heartfelt welcome to you, Jacob. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Stephanie. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, although I would uh, have loved to be with you in, uh, in the flesh in uh, Frankfurt and to see the, the exhibition, which I unfortunately haven't seen. So um, I hope to get the chance. Thanks for inviting me also to speak about this film, which is a film that uh, I have um, uh, used in my research in several occasions. And it's always a pleasure to be able to talk about it in a new context. Um, and uh, this seems to be a very appropriate context for uh, talking about the road uh, since uh, the exhibition that uh, you are hosting is dealing with uh, what comes after the end. And uh, if there is uh, one movie from the last maybe 10, 20 years that, that deals with exactly that topic, it is the road. So what I will do is I will um, not actually talk so much about the road in itself. I will more give it a context that um, we're both within literature and, and within film and then point to some of the main questions that I think that the film uh, poses and which I think makes this film a really interesting uh, contribution to the larger discussions uh, concerning um, apocalyptic fiction and uh, what use they have, what the critical potential they hold. Oh, hang on a second, there we go. So. Um, of course, uh, what you're going to see today is the film, but I need to uh, point out that uh, the film would not have been the film uh, if there had not been a novel before the film. And uh, the novel is uh, also entitled The Road, written by uh, American writer Cormac McCarthy back in 2007. Uh, the story of the novel follows uh, very much uh, the story of the, the film or vice versa, I, I guess I should say. Um, but I also want to uh, bring uh, up the novel because uh, I feel that thinking about the road uh, can gain a lot of um, significance if we contextualize it uh, in relation to Cormac McCarthy's uh, authorship in general, or in specifically in relation to two books. The first book is uh, his uh, Magnus Opus, I guess you could say Blood Meridian, or The Evening Redness of the World, which is a story about uh, the early, oh, well, not the, yeah, I guess the uh, 18th, uh, 19th century uh, American West, and how that uh, country will Back then, the country was ruled by a certain lawlessness that I think is elaborated or uh, reimagined in the context of uh, the road. In Blood Meridian, uh, it's a historical uh, reflection on uh, America as a, as a country uh, basically uh, founded by violence, uh, a, a country where uh, institutions are no longer existent, or if they are, they are very weak. Again, a theme that uh, comes up in the road. And uh, I think basically this is one of the main themes in, in McCarthy's work that, uh, that he uh, brings also or elaborates in, in the road. Um, how, is, how humanity uh, is challenged by basically um, uh, violent circumstances. And the other book I want to bring in in this context is a movie that has 
also been uh, dramatized, No Country for Old Men, which is a more contemporary take on this idea of America as a country that is haunted by its uh, foundational uh, violence. Uh, this novel also deals with the American West and in particular the conflicts uh, in the border area between the US and Mexico, which is an area that uh, McCarthy has also worked with in, in several of his other books, uh, especially the, the trilogy called simply the Border Trilogy. Um, but again, here in No Country for Old Men, we're dealing with an image of an America uh, where violence is the rule of the law in a way. And it's uh, not only that, it's, it's also a very random and a very senseless violence. And I think it's in this uh, landscape of violence that McCarthy is trying to figure out uh, where to go. Uh, of course, his novels, and uh, including The Road, are kind of extreme versions of um, what actually happens. But I think uh, that is just the reflect the, the kind of challenge he wants to to put to to his readers um, to to see this uh, to confront them with this um, uh, all encompassing violence that uh, that haunts America, and then uh, to offer uh, both uh, critique and and hope for uh, the people in these uh, novels. Sometimes there's very little hope. Uh, sometimes there is uh, more hope. So uh, if you haven't already read uh, either The Road, Blood Meridian or No Country for Old Men, I highly suggest you do it. Uh, they are some of the most amazing books. Uh, I would say Blood Meridian ranks in, in my top five of best books of all time. So, so that's uh, highly recommendable if you have an interest in uh, American history and how American history uh, continues to influence uh, contemporary American society. So how I want to approach the road is to say that this is um, a novel or movie that asks a basic question. Is life after the apocalypse about surviving or is it also about having an actual life? Uh, sometimes uh, disaster movies deals very much just with surviving uh, the actual disaster, the impact of the disaster. Um, in, in one way or another. And very few movies actually deal with what comes after you've survived the actual impact of the disaster. And in many ways, I think that is the critical question if we look at disasters as uh, more metaphorically as an event that challenges uh, and changes society as we know it. The question then becomes, how do we go on? How do we go on living? And um, as you uh, will, will see in the road, it's, uh, it's a tough question. It's a big challenge um, that uh, the father and the son in the, in the novel are, are faced with as they uh, walk towards the Pacific Ocean in a desolate uh, America uh, that's haunted by uh, gangs, uh, drifters, uh, desperate people verging on like, cannibalism and so on and so forth. So really um, this topic, America, uh, and I, I think when you go home or uh, if you stay after the movie, I think uh, the question with this movie is to discuss the ending actually. What, how do you read the ending uh, in this uh, perspective of uh, surviving, living, uh, and, and what, what kind of hope is there to, to go on uh, living in a society that's uh, so uh, dest destroyed as the America we see in the movie is. Um, and I want to then turn to a couple of other movies that actually also deal with this idea of a life after the apocalypse. Uh, and I, I'm doing this to inspire you to uh, to go home and see these movies, watch them, uh, and uh, to uh, use them in this discussion of the, of the big question of, uh, of life after the end of the world. Um, it's a theme that uh, 
you can say it started in many ways and in many you can point to many movies where this theme was first introduced but um i've chosen the planet of the apes uh the franchise that was started in 1968 uh here you see an image from the the first movie featuring charles seston um where basically the planet has been taken over by apes and humans are now the um and then apes are now the superior uh, animal and has uh, confined man to uh, to prisoners and fleeing fleeing for his life um that that shows a way of like how challenging that life after the apocalypse can be uh, and even though that uh, charlton heston has survived uh, the disaster um i wouldn't uh, probably most of you would agree that it's not a, a desirable life that he is um, he is living so that 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 again uh, is the kind of a first example of how surviving is not really the question. It's about how you go on living after you've survived and how difficult that can be because the society, the world as you know it has changed completely. Uh, another franchise that uh, deals with somewhat the same is the Mass Mad Max franchise that was uh, started in uh, 1979 by uh, Australian uh, director uh, George Miller and now features uh, four films and with a fifth one uh, on its way. Uh, basically, what we're dealing here with is, is a world where gasoline is, um, is gold. Uh, whoever possesses gasoline is allowed to, um, to, to, uh, to drive around in this uh, area and 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 um, steal from other people and and it's basically another example of a lawless society uh, where gangs are basically controlling the world. There's no longer any kind of uh, government. It's uh, every man, every small community to itself. Uh, again, violence is the rule of the gun. Um, so really trying to survive in this is uh, is a really hard thing um and um people are trying the the good forces are fighting the evil forces uh the love is fighting uh, evil um and i think that the question here is not so much to say which one is the right one is it's just to point at how these conflicts are playing out how societies without uh, some kind of governing body, some kind of social uh, structure is a huge challenge and uh, how difficult that is. So um, there, is a, there is a certain dystopic um, uh, feeling to, the, to these movies. And I, I think, again, that, that is what's interesting with McCarthy's novel or The Road as, as, as a movie is how it introduces some kind of different uh, agenda, some kind of hope into this dystopic setting. Um, another a franchise that has been running uh, that you probably are familiar with is the series, The Walking Dead, that's uh, showing on HBO. Uh, and it's basically a series that follows the life of a group of changing people, uh, smaller or larger, over the course of a, a period of time, as they try to find a way of living um, in 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 a zombie apocalypse or in in a world where uh, there are zombies all over the place, and I think what makes The Walking Dead interesting in this way is that there is basically no other life than just the life of surviving. Everything that that defines the life that these people are living is surviving everything that their, their motives their daily uh, chores are defined by uh, surviving so in that sense you could say that in in a series like walking dead there is no more life anymore there's just surviving uh, and that becomes a way of life you could say then there is uh, i brought took this is a more recent film uh, called uh, Bird Box uh, by Danish uh, director Susanne Beer. And um, it basically follows a mother and her children in, in a world where they have to flee from monsters uh, that um, 
that you can only protect yourself from by blind, blindfolding yourself. So, uh, so that's again another way of yes, these uh, this family has survived. They are surviving, but they are also living in a in a world where they need to be blindfolded. Um, is that a life? I think that's definitely something to discuss. But it just talks about how um, a disaster changes the uh, conditions of living dramatically and and uh, for being forced to blindfold yourself is, is a rather radical uh, way of living and you could ask the questions like how are you able to how are you able to build up a community if you're not able to uh, to see if you are constantly blindfolded all sorts of challenges are, arises from this uh, change conditions that the characters in the movie are facing then there's a, a, a quite uh, uh, common theme in post-apocalyptic movies, uh, which is uh, The Last Man on Earth. There are several movies dealing with that specific topic. I uh, chose this one, uh, I Am Legend, also a dramatization of a, of a novel, uh, actually uh, featuring Will Smith, who is... Uh, supposedly the only one alive in a in a zombie infested world he only has himself and his dog so what i think makes this uh movie interesting is yes he is he is surviving um he uh, he's able to protect himself from zombies he's able to uh, maintain a, a relatively uh healthy and normal uh, way of life within his, uh, his the the apartment that he is or the house he is staying at, uh, but at the same time uh, you could ask being alone in a world and and having to uh, to go out only uh, during certain hours and having to protect yourself if that is really a life it's a safe life for him, but uh, the question is if if it's a, if if that safety um, compromises the some of the basic values of his life um, he has a dog so he has a, another person or another living uh, being in his life uh, but nevertheless um, he is the only human being on in in this film um, here is another uh, more recent um, example of uh, how life after the end of the world could look like. Uh, this is a clip or a still from the, or the train that features in the film and the series called Snowpiercer, where uh, a selected group of people are on board a train, I think consists of more than a thousand wagons that races around a frozen world. So basically the only thing that's left of society is, um, is this train that uh, just keeps going uh, around and around the world. Um, what's interesting about uh, Snowpiercer, apart from this uh, conceptual setup of uh, all humanity uh, within a train, is that uh, the Snowpiercer society, if you want to call it that, uh, actually reproduces some of the... Um, structures that we know from the society before the end of the world. So uh, in the back are the working class and in the front are the elite. It's the elite. Uh, Snowpiercer is a very different society in, in, in its formal setup, uh, but in its uh, social orientation, it's basically the same society as we knew from before. So in that way, Snowpiercer is interesting because it shows that uh, the world might change, but uh, in many ways, the, the way we look at society might not actually change. Uh, we will just end up reproducing some of the same uh, maladies that we did uh, before the disaster. And I think if we go back to uh, uh, The Walking Dead, I think uh, that series also deals with that issue that Yes, uh, the world has changed, uh, but uh, we are inclined to repeat some of the mistakes uh, from, uh, from before the, the end of, of the world. So it's not like the end of the world necessarily makes us change for the better. Sometimes we can actually just uh, go on repeating uh, 
uh, ourselves. And then I want to show uh, this movie, uh, which I actually always uh, loved because <clears throat> it does show uh, a hope for a different uh, life after the end of the world. Uh, Waterworld uh, from 1995 featuring Kevin Costner as a, as a drifter in a world that is completely covered by water, um, but um, where this myth of a, um, of a dry land exists and everyone wants to find the dry land, which is a, yeah, a piece of land that has not been flooded, uh, but no one has been able to find it yet. So people are living in these um, <clears throat> quite uh, uh, primitive uh, huts underwater and uh, are haunted by gangs, just like in the Mad Max movies. Um, but it, at the end, it actually, um, uh, Kevin Costner's character actually succeeds in finding this uh, mythological dry land and he takes this woman in the picture and her child uh, with him. But then what actually ha happens when they reach the dry land is that you think, okay, now the movie is over and Kevin Costner will just settle there with, <clears throat> with uh, his uh, new wife and her kid and, and live life as they did before on the, on the dry land. But uh, he chooses to, uh, to actually return to the water and, and live this new life uh, underwater that he has been come accustomed to. He's actually also in the process of uh, physically mutating according to this uh, aquatic uh, environment in the sense that he's uh, developing gills uh, behind his ears. So he's sort of becoming, um, sort of becoming an, a new um, type of uh, hybrid human being um, that, uh, that live, whose primary element is, uh, is this water. So in that way, his character, in my mind, uh, shows this um, idea that instead of uh, using the end of the world uh, as an impetus to get back to the world as it was before, he's exploring the possibilities of a new world uh, after the end of the world. And then uh, the one last example, uh, Elysium from 2013, um, a film where uh, a elite of people have been able to build this space colony uh, above Earth, uh, a fantastic society uh, where they can heal basically every illness uh, while people on Earth are suffering from uh, overpopulation, from pollution, all the maladies you can think of in a really uh, dystopic world. Uh, you have this in the film, this very, very um, evident uh, distinction between uh, how, how the end of the world is, um, is different uh, depending on what kind of uh, social, uh, where, where in the social hierarchy you are. Um, and this is for me an, an interesting uh, topic uh, in a broader discussion when, uh, when this idea of, um, of uh, other planets or space station being kind of a, uh, a safe room for humanity that if we can no longer live on earth, then we can always just escape into space. Um, if you were in doubt, uh, this movie is a pretty good example that um, it will only be a very few people out of the, uh, it, it will not even be a hundred thousand people uh, escaping to these uh, space colonies. Um, it will be uh, very few people. So, um, so in that way, um, after the end of the world, uh, yes, the end of the world for some and not the end of the world for others. That's, that's another social uh, problematic that I think uh, post-apocalyptic movies deal with and which I think Lysium uh, actually deals with uh, quite uh, pointedly. So I've given you a few examples of movies that uh, you might know, might not know, uh, that you might want to rewatch or watch for the first time. I think uh, they uh, they feed very much into some of the same ideas that uh, that the road um, puts on the agenda. Uh, but before I leave you to just uh, watch the movie, I want to end with a few questions that I think are essential when you watch uh, not only the road but watch these movies. Um, and the first is. 
what will you do to survive? Um, the, sometimes uh, the, in, in, this, in the road, the, the father and the son are, are challenged with crossing some boundaries for uh, what, they, what they think is, is okay to survive. Um, the question, I, I'll put it more openly. I won't uh, go into details with the movie, but I think this question of what will you do to survive? How much will you um, compromise your um, definition of self uh, to survive? Then the question following that is what is the value of life or what is the value of a life? Um, and how do, would that affect your uh, willingness to do anything or what you will do to survive? A third question is what what's make what makes a life worth living, and I think that that is in general uh, the the big question that that goes through many of these movies. Uh, is it is it worth living these lives after the end of the world? Uh, well, I think that depends on many factors, and I think it's it's definitely one of the essential uh, questions that the, the road uh, poses. And I think what it does so pointedly is that it poses it. Uh, through two characters so it's it's not only for seen from one character it's i think in this context it's very important i think to distinguish to distinguish between how the boy looks at the world and how the father looks at the world and then another question you could ask is what defines humanity in in a, in a post apocalyptic world um, and of course the, the 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 main question is is not what maybe not so much what defines humanity but if humanity can survive in an environment like that. And um, that is also a question that runs deeply through uh, the road and um, which I think it, uh, it gives a very um, critical answer to that, uh, that keeps uh, challenging uh, and, and feeding our discussion of uh, what it means to have a life after the end of the world. So with these five questions, I will uh, say thank you for inviting me, Stephanie. I don't know if there's actually were planned any kind of questions. I'd be happy to take a few questions if, if people want to. Otherwise, I will just uh, leave this uh, Zoom room and, um, and uh, uh, have you enjoy this uh, fan fantastic movie. Okay. There is uh, some applause here. You, you probably can't hear. I can't hear that, no. <laughs> no. Um, but still, thank you very much for raising those questions that actually also served as sort of guidelines when you just mentioned them in this very comprised way um, for making the, this chapter of the exhibition, the Apoc Apocalypse part. Um, thank you very much for joining us today. And... Yes. Um, have a nice evening whilst uh, we are going to watch The Road, a film that you just raised. Lucky you. Well, I watched it the, the other night. So, um, yeah. Oh, it's a great movie. Really enjoy it. Uh, enjoy it a lot. And uh, thanks so much. Have Thank a good you. evening. You too. Bye-bye. <laughs>